Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nettling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to grow your business and take your business or your life to the next level. Today, I am so excited to have Jerry Dugan as my guest. Let me tell you a little bit about Jerry. So Jerry is the CEO and senior consultant of BTR Impact LLC, a consulting and training company focused on helping leaders define success on their terms so they can be living a fulfilled, meaningful life with impact and not losing their faith, their families, or their health. His work experience includes serving in the U.S. Army as a combat medic, corporate training facilitator, and organizational development leader. He has led in combat zones, and corporate offices, which sometimes are the same, leaning, learning the ins and outs for building teams and trust throughout servant leadership. Since 2015, Jerry has been the host and producer of Beyond the Rut podcast, a show that shares encouraging stories and practical advice to help pull listeners out of their ruts and into lives worth living. It's not enough to get out of the rut. He wants you to live beyond the rut. Please join me in our theme today of creating a new path and living beyond the rut. Please welcome Jerry Dugan. Hey, Jerry. Awesome. Hey, Vicki. Thanks for having me on here. I'm You're excited. so welcome. Yes. And I have been in corporate battlefields. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that they can be vicious, like politically yeah. even. You know, it's, it's like Game of Thrones in real life. Yeah. Uh, and I was yeah. just thinking, you know, we never had to play that kind of game in combat because when lives are on the line, you can get away with being blunt because yeah. we realize nobody wants to die. So yeah, we, we just go with it. But then, yeah, during peacetime then all the little things start to add up and you have to learn to navigate those and you know who has what agenda and yeah and move everybody forward uh to a common goal <laughs> while everybody's yeah. got their own personal agenda going that's yeah yeah, yeah. Very- and you know and there's the company that i worked for for so long the a lot of the folks in the beginning were military based and so that the way that I, when I interviewed people, I kind of just, if they had a military background, I thought, oh, well, there's one check. You're, <laughs> you're getting closer to the door there for sure. <laughs> because it was easier for them to assimilate into the culture. Yeah. Um, as time passed, though, that style wasn't going to work so well with uh, the upcoming diverse group. But it, you do in the Army uh, and any military, you have a very diverse group to work yes. with him. Yep. And so I ask simple questions always to start, which of course is where do you call home? Ah, Dallas, Texas is now ah, home. Yeah. yeah. How long have you been in Dallas? Uh, I moved up here at the end of 2019. So right before the pandemic for a job oh. and <laughs> did my wife and I agreed to do the one thing we said we would never do, which was have me commute between two cities. And that's what we agreed. We're like, okay, well, we're, Emma's at the end, our daughter, our youngest child, it was at the tail end of high school. She was pretty much doing her own thing anyway. Mm-hmm. And we just thought this is, this is how we paved the way to be an empty nester. So we uh, start to create a life in a new city and get to know new people and have more things to do than in Corpus Christi, Texas. So. Oh yeah, for sure. And uh, this is a great city. To oh, me. it is. Yeah. I just took my, my dad's up here visiting from California mm-hmm. and uh, we went to go see uh, guardians of the galaxy volume three. Oh, together. Yeah, yeah. It's very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually just went to see the little mermaid and I was oh. very impressed. 
Oh man, I'll have to tell my wife because yeah, that's yeah, I was yeah, very impressed. Disney oh. did it. So what can you do? Or if if I feel stuck or any of our listeners are feeling stuck and in a rut, what can we do? Yes. Uh, but firstly, it's kind of funny. A lot of times when we feel stuck, we feel like we just need to get up and go and yeah. we become frantic. And, and one of the <laughs> things I learned in the army that kind of carries over into the book is this idea of if everything seems chaotic and all over the place and I just feel stuck and I need a direction, pausing actually is a very good thing to do. And on patrols, we have a technique called SILS, S-L-L-S. So stop, look, less, listen, smell. Now in real life, you don't have to stop, look, listen, smell, uh, but at least take the time to pause and reflect on uh, the acronym I use is RUT, R-U-T. So recognize the RUT that you're in uh, and then understand where you want to go and then take action to get there. Nice. And while you're recognizing the RUT that you're in, uh, depending on what the situation is, mm -hmm. you may have to look at the five F's, you know, uh, and for me, the five F's are your faith, your family, your fitness, your finances, and your outlook on your future. And that's the priority I give them in my life. And so I, I start to take stock of how are things going in my faith life, my faith yeah. journey? Uh, and, you know, how are things going on in my family? How are things going on with my fitness levels? Uh, finances, you know, it, sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're getting close to dipping into savings here. Maybe that's why I'm stressed. Like, that's like a no-touch zone and <laughs> it's about to get touched. Why is that? And, you know, and really just understanding my feelings around that. And, and oftentimes that's usually my trigger there is, um, you know, we're about to tap into savings for some big expense. And I'm like, I don't want to, mm. like, it's okay. You, you need that big expense because you're making this big decision or this big transition and you're mm. going to make the money back. And it's like, oh yeah. So that healthy understanding of that. And then, you know, the other F, what am I doing for my future growth? Am I mm. reading books? Uh, am I reading the same kind of things that are just feeding, um, my brain with negativity. You know, yeah. I, I have friends that they just get mad about politics, everything. <laughs> I'm like, what are you reading these days? And they'll tell me mm. like, or watching. Oh, yeah. Or watching. And it's like, what if you turn that off for a day or two? I promise mm -hmm. you there's nothing on that TV that you can affect any kind of influence on in the next 48 hours. Uh, so just turn off for 48 hours. I don't know, pick up a book and, and read that a, mm -hmm. a fiction book or, Go watch a Disney movie, something, just unplug for a while from the news. Uh, and they'll just see like, oh, wow, I've been pouring something into my head that's put me in a funk or a rut. So anyway, all that to say, what can we do if we're stuck in a rut? <laughs> it's that stop and take a pause and look mm -hmm. at those five Fs, your faith, your family, your fitness, your finances, and your outlook on future. And is there an underlying root cause in any mm -hmm. of those? There might be a few. And... So then from there, you get to understand which one's got the most impact. Like, which one of these can I address that will make the biggest impact on all these ruts? Yeah. And then understand where I want to go from here. So what do I want my faith, family, fitness, finances, and future to look like? Okay, what's the gap? What action am I going to take to get there on a daily basis? And then that decision to go for it. And that's usually mm -hmm. the hardest thing. We want to hold on to our excuses, our, our, which serve as a weird safety net. I don't know how yeah. or why. Just, I, I run across people all the time that do that. I remember in one of the trainings that I had facilitated, we created a wheel and it had similar to the five F's, which maybe people that are listening could try to do this, create a pie and divide it in five and have those words, the faith of the future and all that. And, and we had to highlight the degree that we, that was men in our life, how, how much of that we were investing in our life. Oh, wow. And so then you could kind of see where the heat map really of where you really are focused and where you may need to focus a little more. So as you were talking about that, I thought, you know, that would be something great for maybe the folks that are listening that are not as in tune for meditating or journaling or anything like that, that might be a quick way for them to kind of get an idea of where they are with those, those five areas. Yeah. I, I'd recently gotten out of a, uh, a rut myself just a few months yeah, back. No, yeah. you wrote the book. I know. Weird, right? The <laughs> irony, the irony. Uh, in fact, I was writing the book when I realized I was in the rut. Oh no. <laughs> I was oh, like, oh wow. 
this has to go in and <laughs> it did uh so it was just real time um life change for me but it, you know it was just uh, i was working in an environment where it was taking a toll on myself and i didn't recognize it i just knew that i was staying up late at night yeah waking up early not enjoying the weekend not enjoying the mornings and these are all things that i valued and cherished and uh one day something happened at work all chaos broke loose and i'm sitting here spending the entire labor day weekend trying to figure out how do i help my leadership patched this all back together. Yeah. And I remember my wife, well, I mean, it just happened a few months ago, so I should remember this. Uh, and so I'm contemplating like, what do I do? And I'm, I'm putting my options on the table uh, with my wife, just kind of mm -hmm. talking it out. You know, I could talk about this with my boss. I could talk about this with my employees. Um, I can make these adjustments myself. And my wife just said, Jerry, why don't you just quit? I didn't hear that as an option come up. And I was like, well, you always like to have the security of income. Mm -hmm. too. And I figured that wasn't an option until we got another job. And she said, yeah, normally, yes, yes, I would say that. However, I want my husband back. Yeah. If it's impacting your health too. Yes. Yeah. And so it, it forced me to go right back to the five F's. I hadn't even thought mm -hmm. about looking at the five F's and, yeah. um, and sure enough, you know, our faith walk was fine. We we're praying, mm -hmm. going to church, those kinds of things that meant a lot for us, you know, for somebody else, it may be a different, <laughs> excuse me, religion. It might just be spiritual. Like I meditate mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I, I live for a cause bigger than myself. So yeah. faith, I'm loose with that. Yeah, it's, it's how you want to apply it. Um, but then family, you know, when my wife said, I want my husband back. That's yeah. priority number two in my life. It's <laughs> like getting you right there. <laughs> yes. And she shared with me that uh, when our son came to visit just a few months prior, when he got home to Corpus Christi, he had called her and asked, are you and dad okay? You know, if you ever need a place to stay, you can stay with me. And she's like, we're, we're, we're not there, but your dad is going through some things and I hope he figures it out. A few months prior to that, before my daughter moved up to Dallas, she had said the same thing to my mom, uh, my wife. Um, she's like, mom, are you and dad okay? And I was like, wow, if you guys had told me that then, I would have quit my job then. No, no job is worth my family. And uh, my wife just said, but you were neck deep in this project you wanted to see to fruition. Yeah. And we felt that if you had bowed out now, that that would be something you regretted. I was like, well, mm -hmm. I didn't want the project to go through. But again. <laughs> yeah, I can appreciate that. Yeah, sure. somebody, else, somebody else would pick up the project and, and get it yeah, done. Yeah, they and, did. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, I mean, I got the project done because it was already long finished by the time this all came about, but it was that realization that my job was taking a toll on my family life yeah. to the point where my kids thought I was going to divorce my wife. And I'm mm. like, no, <laughs> that's like not even on the table for me or for yeah. my wife. Um, and then we looked at my fitness. I had put on 40 pounds in mm. one year and uh, I was stress eating all the yeah. time. Yeah. And recognizing there was also a fitness issue going on, mm -hmm. uh, we realized it, it was time to hang it up. And uh, that Tuesday after the holiday, I submitted my letter of resignation. It shocked everybody. 30 days later, I was out of there and you know, doing what I'm doing now. I published the book. I am uh, started my own company. And uh, but always looking at those five F's. And nice. uh, even when we evaluate the business, how is it doing? Mm -hmm. looking at those five F's. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. So why didn't that milestone of a pay raise or promotion or brand new car bring you happiness? I firmly believe happiness is an inside job. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can have all those things and still yeah. think life sucks. And I know so yes. many people who do. They, they have the six and seven figure incomes. They have the titles they've always pursued. Uh, they, they feel like the external stuff is going to bring them the joy and happiness. But the reality is there's never a car fancy enough. Or... Yeah, there's always something better. Exactly. And the moment somebody else comes out with a new thing, you got to go get that now and you become mm -hmm. trapped in that cycle. Mm -hmm. So, but it's kind of weird because we're taught to go after that. I know growing up, my, my mom, not so much my dad was always about, you got to get good grades so you can get a good job. Kind of the thing Robert Kiyosaki talks about, mm -hmm. so good grades, good job, great pay and retire. And but never really any direction of like, what do you like to do? What yeah. do you value? What would success look like for you in your life? Never any of those conversations. It was just strictly good grades, good job, lots of money, be mm -hmm. happy. 
I'm like, wow, that's, that's not happiness. <laughs> no, no. And I, I know for me, when I retired, I, I wanted to be, you know, spend more time with my grandkids and just do what I wanted to do. And I took two years of traveling and hanging out with the grand babies and things. And then I realized that I was not happy. And, uh, so now I'm as busy as I was when I was working <laughs> full time, but I'm doing what I want yes. and I'm doing what makes me fulfilled. And, um, you know, and so that's me doing me and, you know, for, for my husband, he's happy golfing and doing, you know, watching Netflix and things, but that makes him happy. And yeah. I think that's what people need to understand that it's okay to have a different perspective for what is next. Yes. Yes. And even how you do your daily work, uh, you know, for me being happy at work is being aligned with what I value. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, I have this leadership credo where I believe that uh, we're all created with a dignity that should be respected regardless of who the other person is, that we're all uh, of value. Uh, mm -hmm. And, so because of that, I will uh, always take a people-centered approach to how I lead, how awesome. I do business, how I interact with others, especially in business. And, and as a result, people know they can trust me to treat them with respect, mm -hmm. to be honest with them, and look for win-win scenarios. And I've come across leaders who were in charge of me, and they just absolutely did not like that leadership style. They felt oh, that I needed to have... I can, I can appreciate that. Right? <laughs> Like there are those who come from this school of thought that leadership is always carrot and stick. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting here thinking, what if it's more carrot than stick? And when it is a time where you do have to hold your boundaries, it, it is a mutual parting of ways in a sense. So, mm -hmm. um, and some people just don't like that. They think it's, it's too loosey goosey and you got to have an iron fist around yeah. your soul and people don't thrive like that. You know, no, no. I mean, that's, why I teach leading with the heart, the head and the hands. Yes. Because uh, I spent 30 years of my career <laughs> having people tell me how to do things and, and carrot and the stick. And it wasn't until the last bit that I realized, you know, that doesn't have to be the way you do this. And you get exactly. so much more from your people when they see that they are valued by you. Yes. And even in the military, you know, a lot of people think military is all bark orders at each other, make people do push ups, call each other maggot. And when you're in garrison, it is not that at all. There is a lot of, um, you know, we have duties we have to perform during the day. However, a good leader is always looking for opportunities to give everybody on the team a chance to lead whether it's um, the, the shooting range or collecting supplies for another event, mm -hmm. um, you know, sending them off to a training course. And the idea being that the more I can develop my people to lead each other, the moment, I, yeah, it's kind of morbid though, because in the army, if you're in a leadership role, you, you don't expect to live very long in the leadership role. Mm -hmm. and so you're being judged, not based on how well people did while you were around, it's like, how long did your people live after you got hit? <laughs> and yeah. ideally, they all come out of it because they were able to take up the mantle, carry out the mission, even though you were out of commission. And uh, and I took that to heart that, you know, any in, in the civilian world, anybody who worked with me uh, really needed to be able to lead without me being there. Because, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think, you know, I think this has been a conversation I've had with a number of people recently, but in this changing world that we have that's constantly pivoting and changing but there are so many people that have experience and and tenure if you will that mm -hmm. are choosing to leave and go up on their own as entrepreneurs as we did but also just finding something different and so companies are faced with a lot of people that don't have that mentoring and that um guidance from somebody that's been there walked in their shoes and so they're having to figure it out themselves you know whenever I first started working we had things called um uh, uh basically a manual that that told you this is how to do this job and that manual was placed from person to person as you change as you got promoted and it was updated and then after a time that stopped because it was too much 
too much time to do that kind of stuff. Now, yeah. of course, you could use AI and do it for yeah. you. But anyways, <laughs> um, but so then when you went into a job, you wasted weeks and months trying to figure out with somebody got done in an hour because nobody told you how to do it that way. Yes. And yes. Um, I think for me, that's where succession planning and and being that servant leader where you are teaching and giving as much as you can so that, as you said, if you leave, that job can be still done. Yes. I think a lot of organizations take for granted the value of organizational history. Yeah. And I've, I've seen layoffs in certain organizations where it is uncanny how the majority of the folks being laid off happen to be over a certain age mm -hmm. and with a certain amount of tenure in the organization. And I'm saying, pay this money. That's why. They're yes. <laughs> and it's like, how are we not saying that this layoff was driven by, I don't know, age? <laughs> well, well so, it's really, to me, it's, it's driven by how much money they're making. Yes. So, you know, here's that, that carrot that you talked about. You, you work hard, work hard to, to get that pay raise. Yeah. To the point, well, now it's, you're too expensive for us to have. Yeah. And then they're gone and, you know, the organization set back a year or two while the new mm -hmm. person tries to figure everything out there themselves. And, um, and it has a ripple effect. It's not just like one executive assistant who's working for one person. It's that one executive assistant, it, it, assistant is the hub for probably a hundred people who all mm -hmm. rely on that person in some little way. And then you disrupt that and there's no transition, no passing on of that mm -hmm. organizational history. And it's just like that, that, that often breaks my heart. It's like, yeah. there's so much history there that we just gave up. Um, and there For are other sure. cases where, you know, somebody just doesn't want to change and mm -hmm. it's like, but, but we need to, and, and that's a different conversation there, but For sure. how do we get them on board to help transition to that new era? Uh, we've probably gone off the topic of creating a yeah. life worth living, but lead a, a career <laughs> worth leading <laughs> exactly kind of, kind of adjacent <laughs> so yeah i mean it's not too far off with my next question because the next question was um related to servant leadership and how can that strengthen your marriage oh man um yeah that's a good question <laughs> huge huge uh because a lot of times now my wife and i our our marriage has been in the the Christian context probably since two thousand six seven seven we'll say seven nice odd number we got married in two thousand three so about four years later we we dedicated our marriage to be a Christian yes. a driven one and yes. you know and I had worries about that I, because my wife had come home one day from a Bible study and she was not happy <laughs> and I'm thinking okay I got the kids to school I got them to the right schools. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't braid my daughter's hair, but I put it in a ponytail. They got food. Did they get food? Oh no. Did they get food? And, and this is all going through my head while my, my wife is in the kitchen, like smacking stuff down on the countertop, total expression that she doesn't do. And I'm sitting there thinking, I must have done something though. She's upset about something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not me. Maybe somebody out there in the world upset her. So I finally mustered the courage and I asked her. <laughs> Uh, I was like, hey, Liv. You, the military man. Right? Yeah. The <laughs> combat veteran. <laughs> I mean, she was in the army too, so I had reason to be concerned. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and so I finally mustered the courage and I, I was like, hey, Liv, are you okay? And she said, no. And I'm like, oh boy. Um, you sound upset. And she came storming into the bedroom and she yells, or she doesn't yell, but she says very passionately, I'm supposed to submit to you. And I'm like, huh? Oh. What? <laughs> I know that Bible reading. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and, and I'd probably been a Christian like a year and a half at this point. And I'm sitting here thinking, so wait, am I supposed to say, go make me a sandwich? I mean, I don't know what this means. Like who says you have to submit to me? I'll, I'll, we should have a conversation with that person. Who are they to tell us how we live our lives? And she says, it's in the Bible. I'm like, did they read it right? I mean, like, <laughs> what, what do they mean by submit? Like, what is submission? And she's like, I don't, but I, I'm supposed to do it. And you're supposed to be the head. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, and, and so it just like, it, it just went against everything that I believed in around equality and equity that my wife is my equal. And here's somebody telling us, no, Jerry, you're in charge of her and she's to submit to you. And I'm like, something sounds, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
I don't know, there, there's a clash here of my values and I, I need to learn more about this stuff. And, and what I learned was, yes, there is this headship thing. However, if you like dig into Ephesians, it's like uh, somebody, another man helped me unpack this. He said, don't think of it like the typical guy in the 1950s who's expecting to have dinner served when he comes home from work, because that's what made your wife upset. She thought that's what she has to do. And um, I'm like, yeah, I don't want that. That no, I'm I'm the better cook between us anyway. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I love cooking for her. On top of that, that's like something that makes me happy. Um, so I don't I don't know where she feels that has to be the thing. And and this man helped me unpack that. If we're really looking at headship, it, it's to be like Jesus. And if you look at how Jesus led, he didn't lord it over people and tell them what to do. Although he did tell them like go out and do this and do that. But he surfed them like he he got down on his knees and he washed people's feet. He did like the lowest task that you could do in that culture. Uh, he sacrificed his life for the church and to redeem people. And it was like, wow, everything about him was sacrificial to lift up the people around him, not to lord over them. And the guy was like, now you're getting it. I was like, I can do that. So headship isn't really like, hey bring me a sandwich and a beer. And he's like, no, and it better not be because I'll hear about it and I'll, we'll have words. I'm like, okay, good, good, good. Uh, so it's more like say a presidency and I've got to get reelected every night. It's like, that's closer. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it's looking for ways to serve my family. You know, what, what, what kind of father does my daughter need? It's going to be different than the kind of father that my son needed. Um, you know, what kind of person does my wife need? It's going to be very different than what my kids need. And so serving their needs putting them ahead of my own selfishness, uh, even though I do have needs and I do need a voice, you know, things that I have concerns with uh, or that I have a need. But overall, if I'm striving to take care of them, uh, at some point they turn around and they want to also do the same for me. They're responding to the way I'm leading at home. So that's, that's for me why I think servant leadership is a, a great way to strengthen family relationships. Uh, yeah, and you really, if you take it back to um, living beyond the rut, I think sometimes that we do get so busy with kids, with work and everything, and a rut is just that comfort, you know, no, no friction, <laughs> you <Yes>. know, and, <laughs> and yet, um, is it fulfilling for either party? Yeah. Whenever you're in that rut. Yeah. So. And sometimes we serve our partner by sharing with them. This is bothering me. Yeah. Here's why I think it's bothering me. Uh, but I know we're not enemies. So I, I, I like to understand more of where you're coming from. Uh, yeah. Now that is typically something my wife would bring up first until I got more mature <laughs> and, uh, and I got better at realizing uh, I started applying something called halt. Like whenever I got upset at, in an argument or a discussion, uh, started to recognize, wait, am I hungry? Oh man, I'm hungry. Okay. So I'm hangry right now. And you know, my wife would have a little snack there waiting for me. I'm like, Oh, mm. <laughs> how do you know? She's like, well, you haven't eaten anything since breakfast. You, you got in the zone and you're probably hungry at seven o'clock uh, PM. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Uh, you know, the snacks usually like a candy bar or some chips, like, Hey, eat some of those, come back and talk to me. Uh, but you know, Halt, uh, you know, hungry, am I angry about something else? And that emotion is just carrying over into this conversation. Uh, am I feeling lonely or unheard? Um, so maybe even if I'm surrounded by people, I don't feel connected to the people around me. Like they don't get where I'm going uh, or thinking. And, and T, tired. Yeah, I, I used to, I still do, get up earlier than anybody else in my family. So, um, you know, I also get tired before anybody else in my family, which means I probably get cranky before anybody else in my family. Um, so having, you know, and, and being a servant leader, uh, learning, I need to make those adjustments and have that kind of awareness to know what I'm bringing to, to the home and, and being aware if that's a good thing or a, a, a negative thing. So whenever we talk about your morning, kind of run us through what that morning routine looks like. Okay. Uh, typically, uh, when I'm more rigid about it, it's uh, I roll out of bed and I spend about five minutes uh, in silence. Uh, for me, it's prayer. Uh, thank you. I get to breathe again. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. looking forward to, you know, and, and saying to myself, what am I looking forward to today? Uh, and just being thankful for the day. Uh, when I get up from there, uh, I sit down and I journal for a little bit and I start to visualize you know, what would a winning day look like today? And so it kind of morphs into a to-do list, but it's really uh, one of the one, two or three things that'll make 
the whole day a winning day. You know, sometimes it's work related or a lot of times it's work related. Other times it's today's a win. If I remember to call my wife around lunchtime, uh, I work from home now. So that's, that's too easy to do. It's like, Hey, what are you doing over there? <laughs> and she's like, I just started reading. I'm like, I'm sorry. Um, and, and then from there, you know, start visualizing what that looks like. So, uh, so affirmations, so silence, affirmations, uh, some visualization, um, and then if my buddy Mike from across the street says, let's go for a ruck march, we'll go get some exercise in. And then depending on how much time I have left, I'll do some reading. And yeah, the journaling was, I cheated and I, I get the journaling in at the front end. So uh, that's when I'm much more formal about it. Uh, when I'm more loosey goosey, I get up, still do the thing in the, with the silence in the morning, but then I choose out of the rest of that SAVERS acronym from uh, Hal Elrod's uh, Miracle Morning. I'll just pick one. What do I want to do today? I just want to spend all two hours planning. All right, we'll do that. Or I want to really rock for an hour. That's going to eat up all your time because you got to get cleaned up and you're going to want some coffee afterwards. Uh, so yeah, it's just two hours of dedicated develop Jerry time. That's, that's, that's awesome. Morning. That's awesome. So it's time for rapid fire. We okay. are moving quite along. Uh, so if, um, for those that are new parents out there, you're a dad. So what parenting, vi parenting advice would you give to new fathers? They haven't even got the routine yet to get the rut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what advice would you give them to kind of avoid the rut, but also to be more impactful and helpful as a parent? Yes. Uh, I know when I was a younger parent, uh, especially being in the military, this was not a good combination. <laughs> <laughs> and, and having a mom who's from Thailand, it was definitely like the trifecta uh, no. of uh, maybe Jerry didn't have it quite right. Uh, so I went in with the impression that I had to make sure my kids were always well behaved, that they got good grades, that they made everybody look good, especially themselves. And it took a lot of conversations with uh, Olivia, my wife, to help me let go of that. And you know, as I started to embrace, you know, servant leadership as well, I started to realize it's not about molding them into who I am. I didn't want copies of Jerry and that wasn't the best thing for them either. It was realizing, and the sooner we can get to this and, and realize that the best thing we could do for our children is help them learn how to navigate the world. Yeah. And we, from the moment they can start to speak and think and act out, you got from that moment until they're about 16 ish, 17 ish. Yeah. <laughs> Give or take a few years, but I'll say 16. You got until about 16. Um, what you want to do is help them navigate the world and see you as a trusted advisor. And um, so I'm kind of cheating. I'm throwing in like three pieces of advice here because <laughs> uh, the other thing is you want to maintain the trust of mm. they can come to you with problems, especially as they become teenagers. Mm -hmm. That was something I felt we did pretty well that um, we did okay. <laughs> uh, our kids got as much advice from us as they did from their friends. And mm -hmm. they knew they could be open with us. Uh, and we wouldn't punish them because they told us they needed our help. Yeah. Uh, we would thank them for coming to us. And we got to the point where their friends would come to us for advice. And we're like, now we might be crossing some boundaries, guys. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> why are you coming to us and not your own parents? And like, oh, our parents will ground us the moment we bring this up. And we're like, oh, what are your alternatives? Well, mm -hmm. our friend over here will give us advice. We're like, oh no, not that kid. Okay, um, <laughs> we'll risk our friendship with your parents. And yeah, I know I've been this. there, yeah, for sure. <laughs> So there you go. Keep the channels of communication open. So yeah, yeah, help them navigate the world. You don't have as much time as you think. And um, you, you want to keep those channels of communication open um, because they're going to they're gonna need you and they That's need awesome. to come to you and not get punished for it. We actually have covered through our back and forth conversation, which I love, all of my rapid fire questions. So it's time for us to go ahead and share my screen. Yay. I know. I'm a good, I'm a good guest. <laughs> you are an awesome guest. All right. For those that are listening in and not seeing this, you can of course go to my YouTube site uh, or my website to be able to view the video, which you would love to, for you to do. But 
I will give you the website information for Jerry right now. He is at https colon forward slash forward slash www.beyondtherut.com. Again, that's beyondtherut.com. Behind him, way in the back, you see his book, I believe. In social media, he can be found primarily on LinkedIn and searching by his name, and then in Facebook, Beyond the Rut. I'll let him talk to you a little bit about when you uh, use the link, um, beyondtherut.com slash audiobook, what you'll find. Yes. Uh, so I wrote a book and it's called Beyond the Rut, Create a Life Worth Living in Your Faith, Family, and Career. And it walks through using the RUT uh, acronym or acrostic and the five Fs. Shares a little bit about my story, but that's at the tail end uh, because you're the hero and it's your journey mm -hmm. that's happening in this book. Uh, so if you want that book for free because you like to listen to audiobooks when you drive to work or uh, it's just easier than reading, uh, you can get a free <laughs> copy of it beyondtherut.com slash audiobook. It lasts about two hours and seven minutes. Uh, but if you want it in half the time and you want to see what I sound like as a chipmunk, just put <laughs> it at double speed. <laughs> I, I take enough breaths in between my sentences that it, it sounds almost coherent. I've listened to it a couple of times at double speed just to see. And I was, I was well, I was amused. <laughs> yeah, you're just too funny. Well, I have just enjoyed this. You are wonderful to interview, to talk with. I, I think I want to be your friend and meet Olivia. <laughs> oh, she's awesome. She and, is so awesome. So patient. I'll tell you. <laughs> it's so as always, I thank you for sharing your thoughts, your gifts. You have great acronyms. I'm going to re um, listen to this so that I can get all those down to put in my show notes so, so people can have that easily um, at their fingertips. But uh, as always, I remind everyone that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nettling, where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.